Welcome to Webster Gardens. I'm Dave McGinley, one of the pastors here, and we're so glad that you're joining us for worship through our live stream. Whether you're a regular worshiper here at Webster Gardens or whether you're checking us out for the very first time, we want to get connected with you. You can find information in the description box of this video that will help us walk alongside you as you discover the next steps that God has intended for your life. But we want you to take next steps, and we want to encourage you to get connected to a local Christian church. Or if that's here at Webster Gardens, we would be so honored. I'd love to see you here on a Sunday morning or on a Monday evening in worship. Now, let's worship our God. Well, good morning and welcome to worship. My name is Pastor Dave. I'm one of your pastors here at Webster Gardens, and we are so excited that you have joined us in worship here today, whether you're here in person or joining online. Welcome to worship here this morning. If you take a moment, as we do here at Webster Gardens, to check in to let us know that you are here with us by simply checking in, it helps our our staff, our ministry teams, uh, better execute the ministry that we believe that God has called us to do here. So it is a blessing to us when you check in. If you can do that on uh, your Webster Gardens app, or if you're a guest with us here today, uh, we'd love for you to fill out one of these Connect With Us cards, which are located in the pew rack right in front of you. And I'd love to meet you after service, especially if you're a guest. I'll be hanging out over by the welcome desk by the front doors over here. We have a gift for you here this morning. Uh, Today, we're going to be looking at this text in Matthew chapter 2 as the church enters into this new season that's known as Epiphany where our culture has kind of moved on from Christmas, we in the church continue to ponder at the wonder that our God is with us. And so let's do this this morning. I want you to stand up and I want you to greet somebody with a spiffy epiphany and say happy spiffy epiphany and let's welcome each other to worship this morning. It's wonderful that we're here together in worship. Let's sing our opening hymn, Joy to the World.
God meets us here. He is present with us today. And we make our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit who meets us here. Amen. We sang joy to the world. You know, the depth of our joy is related to the depth of our need. Our need for our broken lives to be restored. What we know is that our God came. And he came to restore our lives. He came for our deepest need. So let's together confess our sins to this God who came to us. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Joy to the world. Here's the joy. That God has come near to you. He's come near to you in Jesus. And Jesus has met the demands that God rightly demands of us. He has loved God with his whole heart. He loved all of his neighbors as himself. And that righteous relationship that he has with God, he gives to you. He came to forgive you through his death and his, his death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave. So you stand forgiven. This is the true joy to the world and it's joy for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. You know, in our his, church's historic liturgy, this time of confessing and being forgiven would often be followed by the Kyrie, Kyrie eleison, meaning Lord have mercy. The celebration of the salvation that we have through God's mercy, his love for us. Our choral group is going to share that with us.
celebrate that great mercy that God has shown to us through Jesus Christ. Kyrie eleison. Thanks, choir. You know, that epiphany is a celebration of God bringing that mercy, not just to his people of the Old Testament, the Israelites, but to all the world. Our creed celebrates that. Who our God is, this mercy bringing God. Let's join our voices together and let's share the words of the Apostles' Creed, knowing that it is a message of who God is, not just for us here at Webster Gardens, but for the whole world. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. That message is for the entire world. Let's continue to connect with Epiphany and how that and, and the narrative of those magi, those wise men, coming to see Jesus with our children's message. Well, I'll tell you, it is pretty miserable out here right now. It was raining just a little bit ago. The temperature has dropped like 15 degrees. It is pretty cold. And it's not that nice cold where you want to sit by a fire pit and have hot chocolate. It's really no fun being out here right now. I would rather be inside. So what would make you be out in crummy weather like this? It would have to be something that's important. Maybe you'd be out here to wait in a big long line to see your favorite singer. Or maybe if your pet was lost and you were out searching for it. You know, if someone told me that there was a million dollars that was buried in my backyard, I might go out in this. It's starting to rain again. But you know who went out for a really long time when no one even told them to go? The Magi. Some people call them the wise men from the Bible. Here are some Magi toys in this nativity scene. You know, I wonder if they knew that 2,000 years later they'd be made into toys. If there would be toys of you in the year 4,000, wouldn't that be kind of weird, right? You'd want to know that. Anyway, they weren't really here at the same time as the shepherds or the stable or the manger, but they came from the east. We're talking 400 to 600 miles away. Now I can drive about 400 miles in like six hours. It would have taken them over a month. Well, it's like starting to sleep now. And you might say, oh, well, it was probably really good weather and they were fine. But through that month, Sometimes it is hot. Sometimes it's cold when you're up in the mountains. There's windstorms in the desert. There's rain that makes everything muddy. What would make them put up with a month of whatever the weather brought? See, they had some nice cozy homes. They had all the clothes in their own closets. But they left those homes because they had a question. Where is the one who was born the king of the Jews? We have seen his star in the east and we have come to worship him. They knew that a king had been born who was greater than any other king. A king who was worth packing up all your bags, getting all your people together, buying expensive gifts, and traveling over a month to a strange place to come worship him. And that's what they did. And who they found was Jesus. So let's go back to that original question. What would make you brave a bunch of crummy conditions like this? Only something really important. Well, know that you were really important to Jesus. He took a trip that was even harder than the wise men's trip. It was a trip up to a hill to die on a cross. And Jesus did that because you were important to him. And so the best thing for you and me is to make Jesus the most important thing in our lives. So let's take time in our day, every day, to set other things aside and we bring our gifts and we worship Jesus. Good morning, I'm Zach. I'm the director of groups here at Webster Gardens. Today our gospel comes from uh, Matthew, the second chapter. We're we'll gonna start at verse one. It says, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, 
wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Who is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw this star, and when it rose, and have come to worship him. When, Jesus the ki- when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them where the ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down, and they worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to King Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. This is the word of the Lord. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who has met us here, a God who comes to seek and save the lost, this world, and us here in this place. And so, Lord, we pray here today that as we look to your word once again, may your spirit guide and lead us here to see you a little bit more clearly. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, one of uh, my favorite hymns that we sing during this Christmas epiphany time is a hymn that we began with here today, Joy to the World. And like most hymnody, it's filled with just uh, much richness and depth in the lyrical content that, that we sing. I, in particular, love these words that we sang here this morning, that he comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found, far as, far as the curse is found. Now you know why we're in trouble if Pastor Dave's singing with the choir someday. But it's beautiful. I mean, think about these words. Ponder these words that we sing. That the blessing of Jesus has come into this world because the curse has gone far. Far geographically, but far in depth as to who 
we are. And Jesus has come to battle that curse, to redeem that curse of sin that has entered into this world. Because the curse of sin has gone far. And it's not void during this Christmas season. I mean, think about it for a second. How was your Christmas time? It, it, sure, it was probably filled with lots of food and family and friends and cookies and good meals and presents. But it was also maybe filled with Awkward conversations, when are they going to leave my house, and I can't believe they parent that way. Far as the curse is found. It was interesting, uh, we were meeting with some of our friends from Chicago after Christmas had happened, and uh, we were sitting around reflecting about our Christmas experiences, and my friend Eric had said to me, he said, you know, uh, statistically speaking, the most likely time that you'll have a heart attack during the year is Christmas Eve. I was like, that's not true. Prove it to me. So sure enough, he pulls out his phone and the USA Today posted an article a number of years ago that said that you have a 40% chance to more likely have a heart attack on Christmas Eve at 10 p.m. is the most likely time to have this happen because of all of the stress, all of the drama, all of the family coming together. See, far as the curse is found, joy has come into this world, but it is battling this curse of sin and brokenness that exists in our world. Which is why today I want to look at Matthew chapter 2, this verse that we just heard read from Zach, and I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2 here. So why don't you grab a Bible, open up your phone here if you have your Bible app with you, or if you brought your Bible along with you. I want to look at Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12 here, and we're going to look at how, how Matthew here is contrasting these two kings that come into play here. And how King Jesus is bringing a blessing that is battling the curse. And if there's one thing that I want you to get from today, I want you to write this down. You can write it down on a sheet of paper or start a text message to send to somebody or write a note on your phone. This is the one thing I want you to get today is this. Is that Jesus is a new king for all people in an unexpected way. Jesus is a new king for all people in an unexpected way. Notice here what Matthew's doing in Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. He's pointing out that there are two kings that are present here in this narrative. It says this, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, First king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Matthew here is pointing out two kings that are present in this text. We have Herod, who is the king who is ruling over that region and area. And then we have Jesus, who is this king of the Jews. Now, he's contrasting the two kings here in this text. Notice what these kings' presence brings. Notice what Herod's presence brings. It continues here in verse 3. It said that when Herod, the king, had heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. Do you know anyone like that, that, that hears some bad news, and they just can't keep it to themselves. They got to tell it to everybody that they know. Do you know anyone like that? Here, this is what I want you to do this morning. I want you to turn to your neighbor and tell them, don't be a Herod. Seriously, turn to them right now. Okay, good. 
Because what we see here is that Herod is troubled at this news. He's starting to become very concerned. But notice this phrase here. It's kind of interesting. And all of Jerusalem with him was also troubled. I mean, why was Jerusalem troubled? Weren't these the Jewish people who were expecting and hoping and praying for this king to come? Well, D.A. Carson, a New Testament scholar, he says it this way. I'm summarizing his words. He says, all of Jerusalem was troubled because insecure kings do insecure things. And what he's saying is that at this news of a new king who's coming, Herod's not just going to be troubled. It's going to drive him to do some things that are really, that's really, really dangerous and horrific. And it's going to affect the people of Jerusalem who are living under his rule and reign. In fact, look here, it continues in verse 7. Because at this news of learning a little bit more of who this king, Jesus, the king of the Jews is, it says that Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. Herod in this moment now isn't just troubled. He now gathers together these wise men and he starts to gossip. He starts to bring them together to understand a little bit more secretly in what is fully happening and going on. So turn to your neighbor again and tell him, don't be a Herod. Because this is not good. And as you know, as you heard in the story, what happens from that is then the wise men, they go to Bethlehem to go and find this king of the Jews. And they find him. But a part of scripture that we didn't read today as a result of this is that the wise men are told to not go back to Herod in Jerusalem, but instead to go another way. And it says this in verse 16, then Herod when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem, and in all of that region who were two years old or under, according to that time that had been ascertained from the wise men. Don't be a Herod. Herod's trouble His insecurity, his secrecy, turns into rage. And he uses his power in a horrific way. Unlike this other king, Jesus, who's come into the world. In fact, look here, contrasting this new king, Jesus. In verse 10, it says this of this new king, Jesus. When they, the wise men, saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. See, at this searching out of this new king, there is joy, exceeding great joy. It's found in this king in searching him out. And continuing in verse 11, contrasting these, new, these two different kings. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And then opening their treasures, they'd offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The presence of this new king, Jesus, brings joy, exceedingly great joy. It brings reverence and awe and worship and gifts as well. Because Jesus is a new king. But he's a new king for all people. It's kind of interesting here. Look back with me at verse 1 here. It says this. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Now I'd be willing to bet if you're using the Bible app or if you have your Bible with you, next to that word wise men, there's probably a little uh, letter that's right there that's referring you to a footnote. Do you have this footnote on your Bible? If you're with me, raise your hand here. You know what I'm talking about. Okay. And if you look at that footnote, what it's pointing you to is this word magi. 
This word magi is actually the Greek word that was originally used inside of the text. The description of who these people were, these men who came from the east. And so it's important for us to kind of discover, well, who are these people? Are they wise? Are they truth seekers? Where do they come from? Well, if we look in other places of Scripture, that that word magi is used in another place of Scripture as well. It's used in Acts chapter 13, verse 8. Paul, who is this missionary who's going and telling others about Jesus, encounters this man named Elamus. In Elamis, in Acts 13, verse 8, it says this, But Elamis, the magician, or the word there, is magi. The same word that's used to describe these men who came from the east. For that magician, that is the meaning of his name, he opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. These were the opponents of Paul. Elamis was not on Paul's team. Now, if you're catching what I'm saying here, what I'm saying is that this better description of who these men were that were magi is not necessarily that they were wise men who were truth seekers. In fact, this is important for us to know. In in Matthew chapter 2, it says this, that, that we need to understand through this lens of a Jewish understanding because Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience and this news would have been shocking to them. I mean, take this lens here that we've kind of missed inside of our cultural context here today. That if you were reading this, and if somebody was reading this to you and you came from a Jewish background, it would sound like this. It would sound like now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men showed up from the east to Jerusalem. to To the Jewish audience who was hearing these words, this would have been shocking. How in the world are these magicians from the east showing up to worship this king of the Jews? These are people who are opposed to the Jewish people. Now you might be saying, okay, well, pastor, then why is wise men in my Bible? Why does that exist? Well, a guy named Mark Allen Powell, he wrote a book called The Wise Men as Magi, and he explains a little bit of the history of how this has come to be. And this term wise men didn't come into circulation in your scriptures until the 8th century. So for seven centuries, it was just referred to as wise men. And sometimes what we like to do as people is we like to make it sound a little bit nicer and neater and cleaner for us. And so what we do and why we like the word wise men is we think that these are just people who are seeking out truth and they're coming from great distances to do so. But we miss the original intent of this. Is that Jesus has come for the Magi as well. He's come for all people. And that's really good news and it should surprise us and shock us as well. I had this, uh, I have this friend, his name is uh, Big Will. And this is a picture of Big Will. I met Big Will at a church that I worked at in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Uh, Big Will, that's what he goes by. Uh, He has a big personality. Uh, He has a big beard and he has lots of tattoos. Because Big Will is a tattoo artist. That's what he does by trade. And he came to faith later in life. And he was a part of this church that I was serving at for my vicarage year. And I asked him, Big Will, how did you get involved in church? Well, it started with a funeral that he had heard and and this preaching of Jesus. And so he decided to show up at this church in in Arkansas where we were in the Bible Belt. And let's face it, Big Will does not look like the typical church-going kind of person. 
He said, the first day that I showed up to church, um, it was overcast and thunderstorms were like in the news forecast. And I was walking up to the church and I grabbed the door and I opened that front door and I took one step in and all of a sudden there was this massive clap of thunder. And he said, in his big personality, I kind of figured that would happen. Because he doesn't fit the norm of what somebody would look like in the South to go and be a part of the church. But I love his honesty. Because the incredible news of Jesus is that Jesus has come for all people. Somebody say amen to that. And God can do some incredible things and see what what the church should be is the church should be a place. The church should be a place that looks mysterious to the world. And I'm talking locally, but I'm also talking universally as well. The Christian church should be a place that looks radically different than any other community in the world. It should be a place for the young and the old. It should be a place of where we collectively come together. It's not some curated community. The church should be a place for the economically rich as well as the economically poor. The church should be a place of where we can have disagreements in some of our political views. So we're going to have Democrats and Republicans that are collectively together. The church should be a place that isn't just one skin color that looks only one way, but is a place that is for the brown and the white and everything in between. The church should be a place for the people that are here because we are in need of Jesus. The church should be a place for the person who has not come yet as well. Amen, 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 because Jesus is for all people. And this is the hope that he brings into the world. And something that we see through this very good news. See, Jesus is a new king that is for all people in an unexpected way way. It's interesting. Historically speaking, you can go over to uh, Israel today and you can go and uh, go and study uh, all of the palaces that Herod had during that time. In fact, here are three of them. The first one on the far left is, is in Masada. Herod had built this palace. He was a great builder. He built it on top of this mountain. And the bottom right corner is known as the Herodium. He, he built this overlooking Bethlehem. And he also uh, built a beachfront property as well on the top right over there, Caesarea as well. Herod was this king who was known as a builder who built all of these wonderful palaces that you can go and visit to this day. But Herod built these palaces because he was also a king who was incredibly oppressive, who put heavy taxes upon the people. He He was also known later in his life, according to Josephus, a first century historian, as struggling with paranoia and anxiety. I mean, we heard some of it here in Matthew chapter 2, that he appointed the death of all of these young men under the age of two in Bethlehem. But he was also known as one who actually killed his own wife and two of his kids, He ruled and he used his power only for his benefit. Whereas Jesus is not like that. In fact, Luke chapter 2 says it this way. In Luke chapter 2, 7, that Jesus, when, when she or when Mary gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. King Jesus is one who doesn't even have a place for him to stay at his birth. And also we see in contrast, Jesus is the one in Matthew chapter 27 as he's hanging from the cross. A a Roman ruler during that time, a centurion, sees Jesus who's hanging on the cross to 
be the sacrifice for those who trust and believe in him and give them eternal life. We see this, the centurion says that those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place and they were filled with awe and said, truly this was the son of God. That in Jesus' moment of suffering, we see him in his glory as well ruling as a king. My point is simply this that we see all throughout scripture is that King Jesus sacrifices his life for his people. Whereas Herod, King Herod, will sacrifice his people for his own kingdom. This is what your God has done for you, your king, as he has laid down his life for you so that we would experience eternal life. And this is incredibly good news. Now, before I was telling you here to not be a Herod, and I was only half joking, but I am serious in this. Don't be a Herod means How can you use your power, the gifts that God has given you, not to your own benefit and blessing, but as a service to others as well? And the way that you do that is out of example by what Jesus has done for you. Because he is the one who rules and reigns and is the king that we follow. And so what that means for us is that as we live in this world, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to live? Well, I think it looks similar to how Jesus has interacted with us. Number one, it means that we live in unexpected ways. That we go and we serve people as well because this is how our king has served us. What that means is that we offer radical grace, not dismissing sin by any means, but what we do know is that God desires for all people to know who he is. And what that means is that we live a life that is different because of King Jesus and how he has acted in this world. So I would say yes, joy to the world. The king has come. And I appreciate and love these words that we sing during this season and time because Jesus has come to make his blessings flow. Far as the curse is found. Far as the curse is found. And church, I need, to help, need your help here to sing this last part. Far as the curse is found. Jesus' blessing has come far as the curse is found. To live in unexpected ways because that's how he's entered in. To be a people who offers grace only because of the grace that Jesus has first provided you. To live in a new way because he is the king who conquers sin, death, the devil, and the curse as well. Amen. As we celebrate that new life under this new kind of king, we come before God in prayer. And we include in our prayers the family of Peggy Nusky. Peggy Nusky is a member of our congregation, and uh, the Lord called her home this past week. And so we lift up her family, and we share God's comfort with them, as well as others that we'll include in our prayers today. Let's pray. Lord, you take the old and you make it new, and you do that as far as the curse is found. God, you injected yourself and your love, and your restoration into this world. You came as a new kind of king, and you brought a solid hope for all people. 
And we know that you're faithful. We know that your gifts are brand new every morning. Lord, so forgive us when we cling to the old and expected. Forgive our, our herodness when it comes out from us. Lord, break us out of old familiar routines and rather, Lord, draw us to discover a new life in you. A life that is brand new. A life that is unexpected. Lord, as we recognize that you came to those who were not even seeking you, God, through your work in our hearts, let our new lives then be a light. A light like that star that drew the magi that would draw others towards you. That new kind of king. God, we know that nothing happens that you don't know about. We know that everything is under your control. Everything is under your reign because you are the king. So Lord, we ask that you would bring healing. That you would heal Guy Blackwell and Jen Streck and all who are sick or recovering. Bring them health. Bring them strength. Lord, for Mike Muller's father, John, who's on hospice. For Peggy Nusky's family. Draw them to you. Lord, hold them in the palm of your hand. Give your comfort and give your confidence. Lord, we also celebrate the new life that you bring. For the gift of a baby boy, Lucas, to Alex and Kristen Koch. And we look forward to the new life that you will work in his baptism as well. Lord, for those who don't know you. Lord, for the relationships that we have with those who have not experienced that new life under a new kind of king. Lord, right now, place their faces, their names, in our minds and our hearts to build relationships with other people, knowing that you came to be king for all people. Lord, so we place our trust not in old ways, but in the new work that you came to do and that you continue to do until, Jesus, you come again. And so, Lord... We are identified as members of your family. And so as members of your family, we can pray as you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So while Herod ruled from a distance and with fear, Jesus, the new kind of king, rules with his presence in our lives, coming near to us and inviting us to his table to experience his presence and his forgiveness. That's what he wants for you today in communion. And we ask the question, who is is prepared to worthily receive communion? It's those who trust in Jesus, who recognize who he is, what he has done for us, that he is the king of kings who died for our forgiveness, and that trust in his promise that he is present here in the bread and the wine with his body and blood, as he has said. If this is your confession, that Jesus is God and man who came to forgive your sins, he is present here for your forgiveness, then please respond, yes, I believe. Yes, I believe. If maybe you're not certain about the identity of Jesus, or maybe you're not certain yet about what our church teaches about what happens here and the gifts that God brings in communion, we would still invite you to come forward. If you want to leave your arms crossed, We'd be honored to share a blessing with you. And then afterwards, if you'd like, me or one of the other pastors, we would be honored to share with you these gifts that, uh, that God brings us in communion and about who Jesus is. It was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, Jesus took the cup after supper, and after he had blessed it, he gave it to them and said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And now may the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
that God whose love has been revealed to us, it was revealed to you here. May this, the true body and blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen you and preserve you and keep you strong in a faith that trusts in him, that new kind of king, to reign over your life for life now and life everlasting. Amen. It's been great to uh, kick off 2023 being in worship with you last week and this week and seeing what God is going to do within the body of Christ here in this coming year. So whether you're here in the sanctuary, whether you're joining us on live stream, if you're here for the first time visiting with us as a guest, we want to be sure to connect with you. So I just want to invite you and remind you to check in on the app or use one of those connect with us cards that are in the seat back that's in front of you. We bring our offerings to the Lord. And again, if you're a, a guest with us, you're under no obligation to bring an offering to this congregation. But here, those of us who are connected at Webster Gardens, uh, we recognize that offering is part of our worship and part of the work that God continues to do in us and the new work that he continues to do out in the world. And so we bring our offerings joyfully, and there are different ways uh, that we bring offerings that you can see on the screen, including the offering boxes that are there at the entrances. Um, while you're in the app, if, you're, if you have it out while you're checking in at this time, don't forget to check out the featured section. That'll scroll through the latest things that are going on here at Webster Gardens. And one of those things is uh, involving food. When I get to know someone, one thing that I'll often do is say, hey, can we grab breakfast or can we grab lunch? And we'll eat and we'll talk and we'll get to know about one another. Well, that is what is behind our Webster Connects lunch. And if you're checking out Webster Gardens, I want to invite you to, uh, uh, to put that on your calendar and check that out. January 15th, that's next Sunday. Or maybe you're a member here at Webster Gardens and you've been worshiping with someone or you have someone who has questions either about who we are or about the Christian faith. And uh, that's a great t uh, place to go to that Webster Connects lunch. It'll be in our North classrooms and you get to find out more about who we are as a congregation and what motivates us and how God works in this place here. Next week, again, something else that's big is happening, and that is our new series called The Family Business. It's a study of the New Testament book of Galatians. We're going to be going through that book. It's a six-chapter uh, book in the New Testament. And small groups will be kicking off on January 15th, as well as our sermon series. Small groups are an integral part of who we are. Maybe you've been in a small group, but you're not currently in one. Uh, maybe you've heard us talking about small groups but you've never uh, experienced that before, this is a great way to do that for a few weeks and try out a small group. And so you can find out uh, more about that. You can sign up on the app. You can visit Zach Teasdale, who's our director of groups, and he's going to be at a kiosk back there. And you can pelt him with questions about this new small group series as well. I invite you to, uh, to be a part of that. Right now, why don't you stand up? And God reveals himself to us in Jesus the word made flesh. And then he reveals him to us, himself to us in his spoken word as well. And for centuries, even for many millennia, God's people would be sent forth with this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen.